tardes eh, con todos. Estamos en la, en la sesión de trabajo sobre eh, información sobre el riesgo, data, eh, bases de datos de pérdidas para una efectiva reducción de riesgos de desastre. Para eh, iniciar eh, esta sesión de trabajo, quería eh, poner eh, en el tapete tres puntos para la discusión eh, durante eh, esta sesión. Quiero empezar con el tema de que la información y los datos en la actualidad es poder. Ustedes lo han oído eh, en los medios, en, eh, en la prensa, pero también para la reducción de riesgos de desastres, la información, el tener los datos también son poder. Es poder, es tener el poder de decisión, es el poder de hacer un cambio en una población, en un territorio. Es el poder de cambiar de lo vulnerable a lo seguro. El otro punto que quiero poner en el tapete es sobre que la prioridad número uno en el marco de Sendai, es con conocer y comprender el riesgo. Eh, en esta sesión estamos eh, o vamos a discutir un tema muy importante, el tema de tener esa información, que va a ser la base para todo el resto de eh, prioridades del marco de Sendai. Si no tenemos, si no entendemos o comprendemos el riesgo, no podemos trabajar en prevenirlo, no podemos trabajar en mitigarlo y no podemos trabajar en enfrentar y recuperarnos. Finalmente, el tercer punto eh, que quería mencionar es el tema de las escalas y las metodologías. El trabajar eh, eh, a diferentes escalas nos va a hacer comprender de mejor manera. Ahora nos entregaban un, lat, un atlas a nivel mundial, pero es necesario que en nuestros eh, países podamos trabajar a escalas locales para tener esa información. Y las metodologías tratar de estandarizar las metodologías para poder comprender de mejor manera de, nuestro, de los países vecinos, de los eh, territorios vecinos, cómo enfrentan sus riesgos y cómo eso podemos eh, adoptarlos en nuestros propios países. ¿Sí? Eh, Sizleri ülkem Türkiye ve Başbakanlık Afet ve Acil Durum Yönetimi Başkanlığı adına sevgi ve saygılarımla selamlıyorum. Bugün burada etkin afet risk azaltılması için risk bilgileri ve afet kayıt veri tabanları konulu oturum için bir aradayız. Siz katılımcılara gösterdiğiniz ilgi ve panelistlerimize de sağlayacakları katkı nedeniyle Ayrıca bu güzel organizasyona, bu güzel şehirde bizlere ev sahipliği yaptığı için Meksikalı meslektaşlarımıza da teşekkür ediyorum. Mart 2015'te Sendai'de gerçekleştirilen Dünya Afet Risk Azaltma Konferansı'ndan iki yıl sonra tekrar küresel ölçekte bir araya gelmekten ve bu bağlamda birlikte aynı hedefe doğru hareket ediyor olmaktan büyük bir memnuniyet duyduğumu ifade etmek istiyorum. 2017 Global Platformu, 2015-2030 Sendai Çerçeve Planı, 2030 Sürdürülebilir Kalkınma Ajandası ve 2015 Paris Antlaşması sonrası gösterilen ilerlemelerin gözlenebilmesi, iyi örnekler ve bilgi paylaşımlarının sağlanabilmesi ile işbirlikleri sağlanması için ilk fırsatımız. Bilindiği gibi insan hayatı ve toplumların yaşamı sürdürülebilir ve öngörülebilir olursa uzun vadeli planlar yapılabilir ve gelişim sağlanabilir. Afetler hem ekonomik anlamda hem de sosyal anlamda toplumların ilerleme eğrilerini bir anda kesen 
ve toplumları bulundukları noktadan çok gerilere itebilen bir yaşam gerçeği. Bu çerçevede sürdürülebilir kalkınma vizyonunun öz, afet özelinde afet risk azaltma vizyonu ile örtüştüğünü ve vizyon birliği sağladığı açıktır. Sendai çerçeve belgesine göre afet risklerinin azaltılması üzerine bilimsel ve teknolojik çalışmaların geliştirilmesi temel unsurudur. Bu kapsamda risk bilgisi ve afet risk modellemesi, afet kayıpları ve risk verilerinin kullanımı, araştırma ve teknolojik boşlukların belirlenmesi gibi hususlar karar vericilere afet risklerinin azaltılması konusunda destek ve öneri sağlar. Afet risklerinin azaltılması için risk bilgisi ve afet kayıp veri tabanlarının oluşturulması bu çerçevede kritik bir konu olarak karşımıza durmaktadır. Bilgi çağında her kapsamda olduğu gibi bu kapsamda da kaliteli verilerin üretilmesi, bu verilerin depolanması ve güncel erişilebilir tutulması büyük önem arz etmektedir. Sayın katılımcılar, sizlere panelistlerimizi takdim etmeden önce Türkiye'deki uygulamalar hakkında detay olmayan ama merak uyandıracak küçük bilgiler vermek istiyorum. Afet kayıpları veri tabanı uygulamamız Türkiye Afet Bilgi Bankası geçmiş afetlere yönelik kayıp bilgilerin farklı sektörler üzerinde veri tabanında saklanmasına imkan vermekte ve oluşturulacak planlarda risk değerlendirmelerinin de alınacak önlemlerde uygulayıcılara ışık tutmaktadır. Afet yönetiminin bütün süreçlerinin tek bir bilişim, bilişim platformunda yönetilebilmesi için Afet Yönetim ve Karar Destek Sistemi AIDES geliştirilmiştir. Her afet aşaması kendi özelinde çeşitli veriler üretmekte ve tüketmektedir. Bu nedenle bütün süreci kaliteli ve kullanılabilir veri üretecek şekilde birleşik bir platformda toplayacak şekilde AIDES'i oluşturduk. Web tabanlı ve coğrafi bilgi sistemleri destekli bir yazılım olan AIDES'te ihtiyaç duyulan coğrafi ve diğer verilerin toparlanması için yaklaşık 40 entegrasyon gerçekleştirdik ve hazırlık, planlama, müdahale ve iyileştirme süreçlerini anlık olarak sistem üzerinden yürütebiliyoruz. Veri modelleri çalışmaları için de gerekli altlıkları oluşturabiliyoruz. Yakın zamanda bu uygulamamızda matematiksel modeller ve optimizasyon teknikleriyle karar destek uygulamalarında geliştirmiş olacağız. Türkiye olarak bu alanda deneyimlerimizi ilgi duyan tüm paydaşlar ile paylaşmaya hazır olduğumuzu iletmekten onur duyuyorum. Hali hazırda burada bulunan Türkiye delegasyonunda bulunan arkadaşlarım da e, ilgi duyanlar ile görüşmeye hazırdır. Değerli katılımcılar, bugün burada dört değerli panelistimiz var. Kısaca kendilerini tanıtmak istiyorum. Ee, i̇lk olarak e, Avrupa Komisyonu Ortak Araştırma Merkezi Afet Risk Yönetimi Birimi Başkan Yardımcısı Sayın Tom de Grow konuşmasını yapacak. Doktor de Grow'un e, araştırmaları erken uyarı, acil durum yönetimi, afet riskleri ve afet kayıp verileri üzerine. Çalışmalarının AB'nin afet risk yönetim, iklim değişikliklerine uyum sürdürülebilir kalkınma politikalarına katkı yaptığını belirtmeliyim. Ayrıca kendisi Sendai Çerçeve Belgesi sonrasında BM Genel Kurulu tarafından oluşturulan açık uçlu hükümetler arası uzman grubunun da bir üyesidir. Ee, şimdi sözü değerli panelistimize bırakıyorum. Sayın Tom de Grow. Thank you. I think I have some slides. I don't know if they will come up soon. To advance the slides, is there? Um, I have to come there. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm very glad to be part of this interesting session. I think it's a very important session where we talk about real uh, data, real information. It's so important to, to do all the rest uh, afterwards. Risk management needs risk information and lost data. It's the, it's the basis of it. So I will start by making some remarks from a European perspective. 
um, where we have actually two sides of, of uh, two perspectives we look at it. On the one hand, we look in Europe uh, on what countries need to do in Europe and how it's done inside Europe for European countries to produce uh, risk information and loss data. But on the other hand, there's also a global perspective because Europe is a, a big player in, the, in development of other countries uh, and we do support a lot the, the disaster risk reductions in other countries. So in these two parts, um, we are working. Now, in the one hand, in Europe, since 2013, we have some um, strong legislation which requires us to think about knowledge and think about uh, data. This has helped a lot to frame the, the problem and has brought member states together. They decided before Sendai to come together and work on these issues. Uh, in the global side too, um, we, Europe plays a role in the Paris Agreement, SDGs, and all these frameworks, the coherence between those are a driver for, for risk information and uh, lost data. Because we started in 2013, European countries were already working on uh, risk assessments uh, for a while, and actually in 2015, by the December, they were uh, required to submit their risk assessments, national risk assessments, uh, and share it with each other. And this gives an interesting uh, outcome because we already see that not all risks are uh, similar, and it, it, it gives an, an idea of where the main uh, problems lay and where information is uh, necessary. So lost data on floods, for instance, uh, wildfires, pandemics, uh, these are the main ones, but also radiation releases and terrorist attacks, which are not all in the Sendai framework, but uh, they are part of an integrated uh, risk assessment. Most of these risk assessments were done in a qualitative way. Uh, they were not always using lost data uh, to model risk in a probabilistic way. Qualitative risk assessments are very useful with uh, scenario thinking to look at whether a country has the right capabilities to uh, face the, the, the worst possible or the likely uh, worst possible disasters. And then you develop capacities and indeed in 2018 countries will have to uh, look at their capabilities uh, and, and map those. But there's another part of it, and uh, this uh, for improved DRR strategies, for long-term thinking, for looking at the future uh, losses, uh, climate and uh, driven by urbanization and by, by other cases, you need to go more in quantitative uh, risk assessment. It contributes to the understanding of risk, and you can have dialogues with other partners beyond the civil protection like the uh, finance uh, minister general. Loss data is very important to model those, to, do, to have ex ante assessments, to think in cost-benefit terms where interventions could be, uh, could be useful. So that's the link between loss data and, and risk. Uh, the modeling, the GAR modeling that is done at global level uses loss data, and that is true at national level and local level. But loss data go way beyond that. It's very, very important to have loss data, not only for the loss modeling, but also for loss accounting, of course, which is the, the performance indicators, the key performance indicators that Sendai sets out. We will know whether we go up or down. Um, but loss compensation too. How do we have the right amount of uh, capital ready to uh, compensate, to, to take on the major losses. In Europe, we have a solidarity fund that uh, res replies to these things, and that is very important to, to understand. And the last one is uh, forensics. Lost data and understanding what really went round wrong helps in local prevention. So that's really where lost data has a link to local action and local uh, consequences. So lost data goes really uh, far. The benefits of lost data are beyond what Sendai wants. Of course, it's important what we measure. That was decided uh, in the open-ended working group. How we measure it is even more important. We need good data because otherwise we will not be able to draw conclusions from it. We have to measure it in a proper scientific way that it's complete, comprehensive, current, accurate. And then we have to use that loss data in the whole cycle, not only to report on uh, losses, but to really use it at uh, prevention, recovery, uh, risk analysis, response, etc. 
In Europe, we have bi-monthly meetings with member states. It started quite small, but now more and more countries are really involved in this to, to tackle all these issues, but also with a scientific angle to it. I think science has, been an has played an enabling role in this aspect to think about data in an objective way and to see how it can, uh, how it can contribute. We work, we have, of course, in a data-rich environment as Europe uh, can be. We have a lot of legacy systems because this is not completely new. In the chemical sector, they have been collecting uh, data under uh, the Seveso Directive. In the flood uh, area, the same. And so there's legislation that has enabled some of this. What we did in Europe is to look at all that and try to put it together in one place. Who can use what existing bit to reply to Sendai and the SDGs and, and Paris. Uh, finally, this led to a very flexible approach. We support multiple implementations. Uh, there's not one system that will fit all. Some countries have partnerships with public and private sectors and the data will be there. Uh, France, Norway, Spain. Other countries have quite central uh, systems where the government has a lot of that data, like Slovenia and all. And then you have to work with uh, at that level and expand it to the right way until you can cover all the, the Sendai uh, requirements. Um, a final uh, remark is, so going from Europe to the outside, where is risk greatest? So investment uh, in, in risk reduction should be informed by um, uh, ideally or risk informed. So you need this risk information and the risk assessment, the global risk assessment uh, has really a, a value to, um, uh, for, for Europe to understand where in the world the risk is greatest. Lost data is essential for this and me as a scientist I have made, I've worked on models for early warning uh, like for instance in the global disaster alert system where you train your model with lost data to try to understand when it will be a humanitarian catastrophe and when it will be a smaller event. Lost data is the key to it. And up to now, we don't have the right lost data to get the models uh, uh, very accurate. The same thing is on the risk assessment, global risk assessment, uh, long term, where are society's weakest uh, vulnerabilities and coping capacity, but also hazard data. Again, they are uh, trained by lost data, and this is very important. So. Proper loss data collected by governments with uh, um, the stamp of it, of, of their authenticity, is key to many, many of those things. So those are a couple of the messages that I leave with you. It's uh, the role of indicators is essential in uh, risk reduction. We need data to f uh, build all the rest on. Um, a pragmatic approach is often the right one. Taking what's there already and building on top uh, is, uh, leads you to a concrete result where uh, countries can reply to Sendai, but also use all the data for, for all the other risk management uh, items that are necessary. And finally, uh, there's a strong need to do it, to measure it only once and use the data for many things, of course. So the Sendai is one. It is where data is collected for the SDGs in uh, 1.5 and, uh, and 11 and 13 goals. The, it's the same data that we'll use. And also in the Paris Agreement, lost data is a, an essential issue. So we should measure it as a community and then share it with uh, the other frameworks. This is where it is. Thank you. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz Sayın Tom Gro. İkinci konuşmacı olarak enformasyon ve bilgi yönetim uzmanı Sayın Jutta Mey karşımızda olacak. Kendisi son 10 yıldır Pasifik bölgesinde enformasyon ve bilgi yönetimi uzmanı olarak çalışmaktaydı. Pasifik'e gelmeden önce de İsviçre'de Birleşik Kütüphane Sistemleri için çözümler üreten geniş bir konsorsiyonda çalışmaktaydı. Bilgi çalışmaları yüksek lisans bulunmaktadır. Buyurun. for the very kind introduction and it is indeed a pleasure being here. The Pacific region is fascinating. That also applies to its disasters 
and even more so to managing information for disaster risk management. The World Bank states the highest cost per capita for disasters in the Pacific. It is also the world's, one of the world's most disaster prone areas. It is small islands developing states with strong cultures and oral traditions. It is also the Pacific is the largest and the deepest ocean. It is this geography which refers to or contributes to what is called the digital divide. Often the digital divide is explained as a technology issue and it means limited internet access or slow connectivity. The statistics show internet and broadband access in a global comparison. The dark blue line shows the sophisticated environment Tom's interesting presentation just referred to. The Pacific region with much obvious difference is actually represented by the red line. Most importantly, the, Pacific, uh, the digital divide is not only a technical issue, it is, it is much more a development issue. The information society and the knowledge economy is much impacted by limited access to information. The digital divide uh, with limited education, hampering digital literacy, um, and leading to limited equality while problems in digital governance are documented and not only referring to technical problems. This is the background under which the European Union and UNISDR kindly supported the development of PIDALO, the Pacific Damage and Loss Information System using the death and entire methodology. It differentiates from other death and entire system as this is a regional database with the countries at the first geographical level considering that it didn't seem feasible to establish 22 systems um, within this institutionalization environment. Out of the information, one third of the records have loss and damage information. The project produced a range of awareness materials with fact sheets and reports to explain the analysis and losses. The project also produced reports to explain more complex issues such as loss exceedance curve or the value of indexing disaster losses. The manuals of the death and system were substantially reviewed that they could fit in the Pacific context and a workshop with countries allowed actually to discuss loss and damage data for countries and their way forward. It was realized that institutionalization in the Pacific region for information systems is a significant problem. At the same time, you and ISDR established the information and knowledge management for disaster risk reduction framework and scorecard. It's a very practical tool, a checklist, which helps establishing a business case for an information system, which is one of the baseline and essentials for institutionalization and top level support. The Climate Change Portal, in support of the Griffith University, picked up the idea and established a climate change framework and guidelines for information management last year. Ideally, this framework would be progressed and complemented by maturity estimates on a regular basis. An information system is not only technology, it is much more people with capacities and responsibilities. It is also about governance with strategic alignment and top level support. Information systems need proper processes aligned with business needs and they need procedures and documentation. And technology of course is one but only one of the smaller part or only a part of it with hardware technology, uh, hardware and software and security. The different maturity levels could be labeled as in ad hoc or informed or proactive. This is flexible and can easily be aligned with the organizational terminology. As a focus of the maturity assessment, a capability matrix could actually illustrate who is supposed to do what in the organization. We realized that providing language to leaders and managers for information management is important to make them understand what we need them to do. We need every staff to understand to do this and this. We need managers to support and enable. We need leaders to visibly commit and information staff provides and advises on something. 
the terminology, again, is flexible, and a capability matrix can assist with human resources, performance management, or providing a baseline for professional development. It is also recommended as a part of a framework, and it can be very flexible, adapted to a whole information life cycle to illustrate what needs to be done by whom. In essence, and in conclusion, we realize that leaders need to understand the support for information management in the information society and knowledge economy is essential. Without their support, it's not going to happen. And to explain to leaders this really complex matter of an information life cycle, that it's not only one person entering data, but very different roles, it would be helpful having, having a visualization of an information life cycle that we can tell an easy story that leaders and managers understand what this is about. And then the capability matrix and the maturity estimates would be just complementary tools to improve the baseline. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Teşekkür ediyoruz. Ee, üçüncü olarak e, Afet Risk evet, Azaltma ve Eklim Dirençliliği evet. Uzmanı Doktor evet. Sayın Bapon Fakrettin evet. söz alacak. Ee, Doktor evet. Fakrettin'in e, küresel evet. çapta Afet Risk Azaltma ve Eklim Değişikliği evet. projeleri üzerine 15 yıllık bir deneyim bulunuyor. Kendisinin uzmanlık alanları iklim ve hidroloji değerlendirmesi, erken uyarı, acil durum müdahalesi, iklim değişikliğine uyum ve kapasite geliştirme. Doktor Bapon Asya Pasifik bölgesindeki 25'ten fazla ülkede erken uyarı ve acil durum müdahalesi projesi dizayn ettiğini belirtmek isterim. Son olarak da Doktor Bapon mevcut durumda Samoa, Samoa hükümetinin hükümetine iklimin ülkenin iklim değişikliği karşısındaki kırılganlığı ve hidrometeorolojik afetlere dayanıklı üzerine danışmanlık vermektedir. Teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your brief introduction. Good afternoon. So from Tom's global to Tuta's regional, I try to downscale myself to the national level to look at how actually we fit into Sendai indicators as a national perspective, what success story we are able to make so far by these last two years, and then what are the challenge remains and how we can actually progress forward to make sure that we are able to reach our goal within the time frame. So I try to put together the presentation on a case on Bangladesh perspective. So far, my working experience, be able to come up with a very good data framework to capture the loss and disaster damage data information. So in, in, in, in reality, as a, as a user or as a human being, once we look at any kind of incident or disaster or hazard information, we always looking for an information about uh, how impact it could be for my society, for myself, for my sectors. And to getting that information, obviously you need to understand your vulnerabilities, your hazards, and using those to your risk assessment. But Going to that further detail, the basic information that you need is the disaster loss data or your historical database because we predict future based on the past. We think future based on our history. We learned something and we try to follow the forward. So if you don't have a good data storage mechanism, collection process, you're not able to actually predict or assess your future risk. And that's very important for a modeling perspectives or a policy perspectives to taking a decision. There are 38 indicator has been identified in Sendai framework, which the country need to follow. And those has substantial linkage with all other global uh, framework like SDGs or Paris Agreement or other sustainable development goals. And a systematic disaster data collection and analysis is ensured a policy decision for the policymaker. 
at, at the same time, it's useful for our future investment and also to reducing our risk for future disaster. The government of Bangladesh in 2012, they come up with a joint need assessment plan in collaboration with UN organization as well as IFRC. Through that, they able to develop a, a detailed standardized data collection form or framework which enables them to collect more than 59 indicators for any kind of incident. And that's, they developed this to shared overview of the disaster situation to understand how each sector specific vulnerabilities they have so that they could actually immediately take action for response and as well as making accurate cost benefit assessment for future decision making perspective. And if you look at the framework that they developed, so if there is any kind of disaster happen, they have an SOS form, which is their immediate response. So based on the SOS form, they try to mobilize immediate cash resources to the population for relief and rehabilitation, re relief activities, uh, which they normally do at the phase one. And there is a phase two, which they try to do it more a little bit assessment during the disaster season. And then once the disaster is a little bit stabilized, they try to go ahead with a detailed assessment using a D forms by the sub-district level. And based on the D form, that actually produced the detailed response and rehabilitation assessment as, as well as the, the PDN, which is post-disaster need assessment by the donor uh, or development organization uh, jointly produced. The methodology they, that they use is more qualitative as well as quantitative. So they try to build on the information based on the resource that, or based on the information they actually collect during the disaster and post disaster. So there are a couple of methods they try to do so that they have uh, a process for data, data accuracy and validation of that process. So they have like a D forms, there is a national disaster coordination team situation report. There is a um, disaster management information center dis information. Then after that they try to do uh, community consultation, district level or sub-district level uh, inter interview and all other sectoral um, data collection process. Now, if we try to look at an, a particular incident, a recent incident, which is a 2015 flash flood, how actually that fit to the 39 indicator that we want to measure nationally so that the global level we're able to do a lot of assessment or analysis as well as our national level future assessment. So for the, for the mortality, the country has a quite extensive uh, information, even with a disaggregated data like sex, men and women, vulnerable people, disabled people, those all has been captured through the um, D forms format that they have. At the same time, for the indicator B, which is mostly look at the affected people, um, injured people, damaged dwellers, so those data is also very well collected under the, under the process or under the framework the country currently have. And then coming to the economic losses, there is a little bit challenges still the country face because the unit of measures that they collect the data and the unit of process the Sendai required, it doesn't match it, each other. So that means you need to do a further analysis of the data using your asset value or using your damage or fragility function. But if, again, if you want to do a fragility function, you need to have a very long historical standard database. Otherwise, you cannot able to do any kind of Monte Carlo simulation to produce those damage curves. So that is very essential in that perspective. So you have a consistent data storage and so that you could apply to develop those kind of curves. And at the same time, um, some of the uh, indirect losses like um, uh, indirect and reversible da uh, damage loss data is not actually well captured through the process that at present the government have. So they need to also work on in that process how to capture those data, which is very important also 
to understand your risk. For an example, if you have a, um, uh, um, if your uh, field is damaged by salinity or you, you, you f field is damaged by coastal inundation that's maybe s filled by sand, which not will be able to use for next four years. So how you actually count those losses in your framework. For the indicator D, that's a little bit more critical because we are looking at the same time the physical damage and functional disruptibility. So when you're talking about functional disruptibility, that requires a, a further assessment, which the country doesn't have at this moment, but that need to be work on how we can actually develop those kind of methodology and tools so that we are able to uh, collect those data appropriately. At the same time, uh, cost of implementation of functional uh, functional disruption is also is very important for risk assessment, so that needs to be taken care of very well. And the data collection level as well as quality is still need to be improved furthermore because uh, uh, the, the, the department, the disaster management, uh, the department of disaster management who collect the data, they actually do the only the immediate response. The post disaster rehabilitation and reconstruction is not there highly mandated or not a focused area. So they don't really feel that kind of accountability to store those data in that particular perspective. So that needs to be very important. So in that perspective, we need to be look at a framework which needs to be established. And that's the last point that I like to mention to the chair and as well as the community that unless we, until we have a standard framework, we'll not be able to develop such kind of system. So here we propose a standard framework. Thank you very much for that. Bu oturumumuzun son konuşmacısı e, Sri Lanka Afet Yönetim Bakanlığı Afet Yönetim Merkezi Zarar Azaltma Araştırmaları ve Geliştirmeleri Direktörü Sayın Anoya Seneveri Virante olacak. Kendisinin su kaynakları ve çevre yönetimi konusunda yüksek lisansı bulunmaktadır. Sri Lanka'da afet risk azaltmanın kalkınma sektöründeki temel aktörlerden biri olmasına ve toplumsal cinsiyet konularına katkıda bulunmuştur. Buyurun. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so today and last uh, two, uh, two uh, preparatory days also, we discussed a lot on data. So actually, why we need this data? Data, data? data, we have to analyze and we have to turn into data into information and then this information to insight. Then we can implement the Sendai framework in sustainable way. If we don't turn, turn into data, into information, then we can't decide, we can't make decisions without with only this data. So data and information, we have to collect to implement the Sendai framework to understand what, what is happening to understand when it is happening, to understand what is the extent, and what we have to do for that, for all these purposes, we need data. So then we have to collect data for the Sendai implementation, not only the monitoring. Of course, for the monitoring purpose, we need data, particularly the baseline data and the, the, uh, the after the data. So for the implementation of Sendai data, previous speakers discussed how to use this data in a very technical way. So I'm not going to address that part. So when we consider our databases, most of the data in Sri Lanka, our database mostly used by the undergraduate, very less amount. I mean, the below the 5 percentage for the decision makers or the DRR implementers. So still our damage and loss databases are not using for these decision making purposes or DRR activities implementation. So this is a this is a issue. This is a critical issue. So we have to have a proper mechanism and we have to have a proper advocacy to use this damage and loss data for the implementation purposes. So then if we discuss the challenges, that is the most important one. The morning session, I listen uh, the one of the speaker mentioned that. Most of the time, we discuss the disaggregated data. 
So you can see that we are having a lot of data, but we don't have the disaggregated data at national level. But when we consider the local level, there are a lot of disaggregated data. In local level, if we discuss the things, there are the age disaggregated, gender disaggregated, and disabilities that the social other factors also, I mean the data available. But the thing is that those local level data not translate into, transfer into the national databases. So we should have a mechanism to transfer that local data into the national database. Then we can report, as per the SENDA indicators, we can report it well. So the problem is that local level people, they don't have much capacity and they don't have knowledge on this data, collection of data and the management of data. So in, for the SENDA implementation, we have to consider that part. We have to give high priority for that, to capacitate the local level for the collection, management, and the analysis of data. So then the other one, the, the, my highlighting point is that the, the uh, collection of damage and loss data, particularly in our national databases, as per Sri Lankan experience, we don't have the pri private sector data. Damages and when the damages and losses happen, private sector data not come to the uh, national databases. It is a big question for us. So then when we do the post-disaster need assessment or the recovery assessment, whatever it is, the private sector data, collecting the private sector data is an issue for us. So we have to have a proper mechanism for that under that pu public-private partnership. When we are doing the public-private partnership, we have to consider this data, not only the disasters or the business continuity like that. We have to give the high priority for this public-private sec sector data. Public-public partnership as well as the public-private partnership need to be there to collect all these data, and data collection is not the problem. The data management and turn into this data into the information is the problem. So we have to have proper MOU or some, some sort of a arrangement, proper arrangement to use this data. So then the other one is that the, the, in Sri Lanka, the main problem is in sector-wise, as the local level to the national, like similarly that the sector-wise, there are a lot of data available. When we consider our health sectors or education sectors, whatever it is, data availability is there. But the problem is that we are not sharing that data. So each and every sector, we have to share that data. We are discussing. We have a lot of discussions. Most of the countries we are having that the national spatial data infrastructures, then the data sharing things and all. But the problem is that we are not sharing data. Then, ladies and gentlemen, my humble request is that we have to collect data, we have to store data, and we have to analyze and turn into this information, and then we have to use this data. So thank you very much. Sayın panelistlerimize çok teşekkür ediyorum değerli katkılarından, konuşmalarından dolayı. Soru sormak isteyen varsa çok kısa bir iki soru alabiliriz zamanımız dar. Herhalde konu e, yeterince anlaşıldı. Var mı? My name is Gabriela. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Environmental Studies in Amsterdam, and I'm here representing the UN Group for Children and Youth. And uh, I would have a question uh, directly to Mr. Tonde Group. Um, so you cited the EU Solidarity Fund that's uh, available for EU member states to respond to the to the natural disasters, but. Um, I would like to ask you if there is any effort doing by the, the EU um, to change or, or maybe switch the way that they directed these funds more to a forecast-based fund. Excuse me, could you repeat the, the question? I mean, I didn't get the question. 
Yeah, so the question would be on the way that the EU Solidarity Fund works. That's uh, basically for responding. Um, but we see that the SENDA is pretty much focused on the prevention side. And uh, how you see the EU Solidarity Funding uh, bridging now for more forecast-based funding, if there is any effort to do that. I think there's various ways of, um, in disaster risk management, you have various phases and you have to work on all of them together, of course. The Solidarity Fund is one, one that uh, focuses on situations where member states uh, do not have all the resources to respond to, to a disaster in their territory and then other European countries contribute uh, in, a s in solidarity. But um, of course risk management is, is much uh, more important and there's much, uh, a lot more legislation and work uh, in, in Europe that addresses those things. The risk assessment work is, is very strong and is, is a very good evolution of uh, what's happening uh, and there's an increasing interest to make it better to uh, broaden the scope of the risk assessments to uh, use more science in it to use lost data in it and to to look at it in an integrated way i think that's a very good evolution and it it somehow came also in the sendai framework uh, it in sendai is the same objective risk assessments are, are very very important uh, um, I think it's a way to do better risk management. The robot has a question. I do have 
Süremiz gerçekten kısıtlı. Lütfen sadece sorunuzu sorun, hocalarımız yaratmasın lütfen. Thank you. Thank you very much for some excellent presentations. My name is Michelle and I work for the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center based in Geneva, and I'm here working also with the Platform on Disaster Displacement and other partners who are all really concerned about strengthening data on displacement, um, specifically at the national level. And I'd like to ask the panelists um, if you could share a little bit about what is being collected in your country or in your region in terms of displacement data and how are you actually collecting that? And perhaps if you have any insights on challenges that you face, that would be great. Displacement isn't included under target B as part of a, a huge part of the affected populations. So um, it, I think that puts even greater importance on the collection at national regional levels. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your which is a very important question, I believe. Uh, as mentioned that when the data has been collected at the field level, that contains actually very detailing all everything on displacement, missing people, uh, number of people are homeless or ill, or all sort of data. But when it comes to the national level storage, that actually doesn't capture in that way. So that actually stay, remain at the provincial or the district level. So that is still the lacking we are having. So we have a, maybe a hard copy, but that's actually not stored at the national level. And that most of the country maybe in developing world, as well as the developed world is actually facing. So we, may, we need to actually work together to give that emphasis to the national government that those data is very important and we need to work on that. Thank you so much. Üç milyon yirmi bin insanı misafir ediyor ve üç milyon yirmi bin insanın verilerini kayıt altına almış durumda. Bu kayıt altına alınan verilerle parçalanmış aileleri de birleştirebiliyoruz. Bu insanların ihtiyaçlarını tespit edebiliyoruz. Eğitim durumlarını tespit edip ona göre okullarımızı oluşturuyoruz. Eğitim modellerini oluşturuyoruz. Müfredatlarını oluşturuyoruz. Gerçekten yerinden edilmiş insanların doğru bir şekilde verilerinin alınması çok büyük önem arz ediyor ki gelecekte tekrar ülkelerine döndükleri zaman da e, hayata tutunabilen bireylerin oluşturulması için e, büyük mücadele için bu veriler e, hayata önem taşıyor. Thank you very much. Uh, my, my name is Yolanda Alberto. I am an assistant professor at the University of Tokyo. And my question is, what could be some of the best policies or incentives for the private sector to share and collect the lost data with the government? Thank you. Actually, uh, the, the 
disasters provide some opportunities. So most of the time, uh, the private sector can be benefited uh, using this data. So then uh, it should be a mutual cooperation. There should be mutual cooperation to share this data. Because most of the private sector in involved into these disasters, and then it's a, uh, most of the time it provides a lot of opportunities. So uh, as example for the insurance sector. So insurance sector, if the data available, if the more detailed, more precise risk assessment information available, it will be benefit to the private sector. So then private sector need to contribute uh, with their damages and losses and whatever the data related relevant to them for these national databases. Because nationally, uh, all the data will be analyzed and the risk. At the same time, they themselves can analyze this data and then they can have the proper uh, detailed risk assessment data. So it will be benefit to the private insurance companies and all. Likewise, uh, the other, other the, the private sector companies also, they can use this data and they, I mean, it should be a mutual cooperation. When there's a mutual cooperation, we can use that and both parties will benefit from it. Merci. Et je suis Adamo Marou, je suis au système d'alerte précoce du Niger. Voilà, donc nous avons développé aussi la base de données des inventaires au Niger. Donc on a fait une collecte de données sur 40 ans, les 40 dernières années. Et, mais et ce qui ressort... On a plus, c'est-à-dire on voit plus les aspects liés aux inondations et les autres catastrophes. Alors que nous sommes un, un pays, vous savez, à 77% désertique. Donc nous nous sommes plus euh, frappés par euh, la sécheresse, n'est-ce pas mais donc quand on analyse la base de données, ce sont les aspects de, comment dirais-je, des autres catastrophes comme les inondations, les feux de brousse, les épidémies, les épisodes aussi, tout ça là, ça peut apparaître, les, les décès liés au, à ces catastrophes-là. Mais et, la sécheresse, c'est-à-dire ça ne ressort pas donc, les effets de la sécheresse, alors que euh, au Niger, quelle que soit l'année, c'est-à-dire que l'année soit bonne ou mauvaise, parce que nous, notre euh, économie, c'est surtout l'agriculture euh, pluviale. Et quelle que soit l'année, nous avons au moins 10% de la population qui est en insécurité alimentaire. Ça, c'est même si l'année est bonne. Maintenant, quand elle n'est bon, pas bonne, c'est plus, mais ça ne ressort pas dans la base. Donc, euh, nous avons besoin de votre euh, expertise, donc de vos, votre expérience pour euh, pouvoir euh, améliorer donc, euh, le traitement de notre base de données. Merci. Değerli meslektaşlarım, afetler konusunda her gün yeni şeyler öğreniyoruz ve öğrenmeye de devam edeceğiz. Öğrendiklerimizi paylaşmak, afetlerin neden olduğu kayıpları daha iyi ortaya koyabilmek, riski daha iyi anlayabilmek için, afet bilgisini daha iyi yönetebilmek için risk bilgisine ve daha çok iyi veri tabanlarına ihtiyacımız var. Günümüz dünyası ve teknoloji dünyası, Afet risk yönetimi sektörü olarak da afetler ile daha iyi başa çıkabilmek ve toplumlarımızın dayanıklılığını artırabilmek için karar alıcılara doğru bilgiyi zamanında sunabilmek için risk bilgisi ve afet kayıp veri tabanları ile donatılmış teknolojiyi maksimum safhada kullanmalıyız. Bugün bu çerçevede oldukça önemli katkılar sunduğumuzu düşünüyorum. Sayın Grov risk nerede büyüyor, yatırım nereye yapılmalı konusuna dikkat çekti. Çok kısa kısa özetliyorum. 
Sayın May, afet risk azaltma için bilgi yönetimi çerçevesi ışığında çalışmaların gerçekleştirildiğini belirtti. Risk bilgisinin ve kayıp verilerin hem yöneticiler hem karar vericiler açısından kim, nerede, ne zaman, neden, nasıl ve ne yapıyorsun görselleşmelerinin önemini vurguladı. Yine Sayın Fakrettin geçmişten ders alarak e, afet planlarını yapabilmek için güçlü bir arşiv bilgisine kesinlikle ihtiyaç duyulduğunu e, yine e, Sayın Senevirante verileri toplamak için önceliklerimizi belirlemeli, işlenmeli ve etkin şekilde kullanabilmesinin kullanılabilmesinin önemine değindi. Tüm katılımcılara katkılarından dolayı çok çok teşekkür ediyorum. Oturumumuzu kapatırken öncelikli olarak UN, ISDR ve ev sahibi ülke Meksika'ya bu güzel organizasyonu için çok çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ardından tüm panelistlere ama özellikle bizi dinlemeye gelen siz değerli katılımcılara teşekkür ediyorum. Bu verimli toplantının sonuna gelirken platformun tamamının bu oturum gibi verimli geçmesini ve tüm katılımcılara ve dünya afet yönetimi yaklaşımına katkıda bulunmasını temenni ediyor. Sizleri ülkem ve kurumum adına tekrar saygıyla selamlıyorum. Gracias, thank you, teşekkürler. Los puntos para para terminar. De lo que han dicho los los panelistas, tomar en cuenta que estas evaluaciones de daños son esenciales. Son esenciales, es la clave para los tomadores de decisión, no solo, como los decían los panelistas, no solo para, para el monitoreo de, del marco de Sendai, sino realmente para que los tomadores de decisión puedan tener esas decisiones con información. Y en ese sentido les quiero eh, compartir eh, un ejemplo que, que tuvimos luego del terremoto del 2016 en Ecuador, eh, con todos los reportes y todas la, los, lo, las evaluaciones de daños que se tuvo eh, en el Ecuador, con 3.300 millones de dólares en pérdidas, pero gracias a esa información pudo el Ecuador manejar la respuesta y la reconstrucción. El día de hoy se despedía el presidente del Ecuador, tuvimos cambio de gobierno, y en su último tuit mencionaba que el último albergue fue levantado porque ya se entregaron las viviendas a esas familias. Esto gracias a qué? A una información que sirvió para una correcta planificación de la reconstrucción. Entonces, es clave el tener esa información por sectores, como nos comentaba, territorialmente hablando en el aspecto local y en el aspecto nacional, tomando en cuenta las capacidades, no todos los países, como nos mostraba eh, en el Pacífico, por ejemplo, el acceso, la parte digital divide a los pueblos, divide y eh, eso es importante, el conocer que no podemos estandarizar a nivel mundial una metodología. Hay que trabajar en romper esas, esas divisiones, acercar esas capacidades. Muchas veces tenemos, como lo, lo mencionaba en Sri Lanka, capacidades buenas en el nivel nacional, pero no tan buenas en el nivel local. Tenemos que seguir trabajando para que ese nivel local tenga esas mismas capacidades de esa recolección de datos, porque esa recolección de datos nos va a hacer el cambio. Como, como iniciaba eh, mi intervención inicial, la información es poder, en el buen sentido de la palabra. Muchísimas gracias.